Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Kenny Conversation, brought to you by JEGS, the leader in high-performance aftermarket car parts. Remember to go to JEGS.com for everything you need to fix your hot rods or straight-up vehicles. Fix them up. Well, as you can tell, I have a little different backdrop. I am in Pensacola, Florida, and as Brother Rusty says, I'm racing that old dirt car. But we had to stop everything because we are so lucky today to have one of the greatest race car drivers in our era and the Daytona 500 champion, William Byron. William, welcome, my friend. Thanks for having me, Kenny. I've been watching, so it's cool to be on. Well, you make an old man feel good, buddy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, uh, Ryan Blaney said the same thing. It, it, it makes me feel good that all you young guys uh, – watch Kenny conversation. Well, yeah. listen, uh, let's get right at it. Uh, I'm going to brag on you in a little bit, a little more, but I, I got to, I got to throw a disclaimer. I'm on the road and I always tell everybody, I do my notes. I don't have the printer <laughs> with me, but I got to make a disclaimer. Everybody, this is a message to all of you out there. I'm a big fan of William Byron and he knows why. So I might brag on him a little more than normal. William is a real racer. He goes to all the short tracks, whether it's Slinger, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, and he's a champion there, Slinger Nationals, Hickory, Snowball Derby, you name it. So he's one of us. And, and William, let's start right there, buddy. Uh, yeah. What, what makes you go and pay it forward and go to all these short tracks throughout of America? Yeah, I mean – so when I got to the Cup Series, I felt like all that stuff disappeared for a little while. And I felt like I was just racing the Cup car and it became really like a business. I kind of forgot what why I was doing it in some ways and and uh, some of the fun kind of went away. So I, I feel like going back to the short tracks is just a way to for me to have fun and remember what the reasons I drive race cars and um, and just the pure competition of it. You know, no one at the not many people at the short track level are worried about, you know, what they're going to say to talk about their sponsors and things like that. It's just really pure racing. And that's what I enjoy about it. You know, I spent some of my own money to go race cars the last few years. And I just enjoy, I don't know, I just enjoy the competition and everyone's, it's very pure. I noticed that one of your teammates, Chase Elliott, uh, doesn't race as much as you, but it did, you know, I think his broken leg last year slowed him up a little bit. Do you and Chase ever compare what asphalt short track race you're going to? Do you ever talk to him about that? Yeah, it comes up a little bit in, in passing, like in our competition meetings and stuff. I mean, we're not like worried about going to the same race or not, but uh, we typically do a lot of the same ones just because they're during the week. But um, but yeah, I mean, we definitely talk about it and I feel like we share a lot in common because uh, that's really our background uh, racing the super late models. So for me, and him, I feel like it a lot correlates, you know, to what we do on Sundays in those cars. Yeah, well, we're going to get to your stats in a little bit. But, uh, man, oh, man, you won the Slinger Nationals, and, and that's one of the toughest racetracks in the world. It, you know, yeah. just not America. That is a I, – I believe I ran like – I drove one of Matt Kenseth's cars there when they repaved it. I think I ran a 9.93. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds about I was right. Getting, I was getting it, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude. It's, uh, I think it's, I, I wish I remember exactly, but I think it's, I feel like it's 10 or 11 second lap times. Yeah. Um, like a mid 10 is, is pretty good, but it's, yeah. dude, it's your tongue's hanging out every time you go there. I've been there twice. And yeah. this past time I went there right after the Atlanta race, uh, in the summer. And I had, I was like four or five hours of sleep and I went out and made a practice run and right. I could not. I could not get my breath to come back. It was... you, you know what's funny about that? First of all, let, let's let all the fans know you were the 2022 winner at the Slinger Nationals up there in Wisconsin, home of Matt Kenseth, the great Dick Trickle, Joe Shear, the legends of our sport. But uh, yeah, you know where I find being out of breath uh, is every year that I would – and I'm asking you this. Uh, every year – the first practice session at Bristol, uh, just, I'm like, hold, hold on. I'm dizzy. I'm like, okay, the car's doing this or I don't know yet. Yeah. No, it, 
it's the same way. I feel like it honestly, uh, like you're kind of wondering to yourself, how am I going to do this for four hours? <laughs> Cause I'm just out of breath, but it's that way every year for sure. Yeah. And then the next practice session, we're ready to go. Well, that was just a little prelude to uh, what we're going to talk about. And uh, listen, you did it, my friend, as we just said from the short tracks and you are a Daytona 500 champion. Um, you know, I know that we had you on Trackside Live in Atlanta, but, you know, hundreds of thousands of fans are watching this right now, and they didn't hear us at Atlanta. So yeah. tell me a little bit. Uh, we'll go through a little bit of the race, but for right now, what's it feel like? Uh, any new things happening or as things calm down? Man, I mean, they haven't calmed down yet. I feel like it's it's just it's just trying to get back in the normal uh, routine you know we yesterday we were at the simulator as a team and we do our meetings on Tuesdays so just doing all that stuff but today we we're doing we shook hands with all the employees at Hendrick Motorsports and uh and handed out some rings actually for last year uh but but yeah I mean it's surreal it's um it's been a crazy kind of whirlwind and it's cool I finally got the trophy in the uh, living room so I think having that thing back back in my possession has been the been the moment that it's kind of sinking in. We have a little fun every once in a while. I don't think you'll you'll mind me asking this. Where are you right now? So I'm at my house. So yeah, I uh, I live in Charlotte, and uh, I moved here about uh, in July. So yeah, uh, pretty new, but but yeah. And the trophy's in there. It's in there. Yeah. Now, <laughs> are, are you are you like the the 26 year old kid? Is it like uh, in your living room by your TV? It is. <laughs> <laughs> is. Is it? It's on the it's on the coffee table. So oh yeah, hell yeah. Uh, I don't have much else. So it's uh oh you got a lot. <laughs> you got a lot. Hey, I, I gotta tell you this. Um, uh, and I always remind everybody this is Kenny conversation. This is not an interview. Uh, years ago, when I was your age, obviously, uh I had everything in my living room. And uh I went to my hero's house, Dick Trickle, and yeah. I walked into his house and there was zero racing. Like if you would have walked in Dick Trickle's house, you would not even known he was a race car driver. Really? And he was a philosopher. Now you got, you got time yet, but I learned that there were so many peaks and valleys in racing yeah. that the message was, uh, there was a day that I said, okay, honey, we're going to get rid of all, all the racing. Cause when I come in the house, I got to, I got to, I look at a picture. I look at, oh yeah. I had them put, cause I'd look at the trophy. I'd look at a picture and it would take me back in time. So yeah. where, is, where is all your trophies at? Yeah. So, I mean, I keep a lot of them in my office, which uh, I don't have a real job. So it's, I don't, I don't really do a lot of work in the office, but it, uh, but I keep all of them in the, in the office there. And then I keep some of the trophies, you know, uh, just scattered around the house. But a lot of the cool ones were just, um, I mean, obviously the cup wins and then, the Slinger Nationals, that was a really cool one because it's got your name on it. So um, I like that one. We're go we got to get to the Daytona 500. But but one more question because my mind is racing. Uh, I went to Hendrick uh, Motorsport, and I think I went there and I, I went past one of the offices. I, and I think Jimmy Johnson, does Hendrick, uh, yeah. does he give you each driver, does he give you your own space, your own office at Hendrick? So I don't have one, no, but I just share it with uh, my crew chief and my my team. But they uh, they changed the shop quite a bit a couple a few years ago. We all kind of went to the same working in out of the same space, and uh, so now we have like a twenty four room nine five forty eight, and uh, and I spend most of my time in there. Okay, all right. So th that started out with where's your Daytona five hundred trophy morphed into where's all your trophies. <laughs> and uh, so th that was a little fun. We knocked out a lot of information right there. Okay, so the Daytona 500, uh, and yeah. we talk, we've already talked about this, but I'm going to say this again to you, and I want you to respond. Uh, it became a numerical highlight in your career. Uh, in 2024, you win the Daytona 500 with car number 24. Yeah, and and because of the the rainout, because of you all racing on Monday, 
you literally win the Daytona 500 on the 40th year of existence of, of, of Hendrick Motorsport. Um, yeah. Tell me about the numerology uh, situation and what B Mr. Rick said. Yeah, it's pretty wild. So, I mean, obviously going into this 40th year, a lot of hype, a lot of, you know, excitement around Hendrick Motorsports. We got the, the maroon cars for Martinsville. And then, um, you know, actually in our pre-race uh, or pre-season meeting, uh, Linda Hendrick got up there and gave Ooh. an awesome speech wow. and really inspired everybody and um, got us ready to go. And and um, the message was go out there and try to win the Daytona 500 and and try to win the championship. And um, and so when we got down to Daytona, it looked like the weather was bad. And and Mr. H actually said at the partner event on Saturday night, how cool would it be if we won on Monday? 40 years to the day. And uh, of course, at that time, you're just trying to think of how am I, how am I going to get through this race? But it's pretty special. I feel like all four of us really had a chance to win that race. And um, I feel like one of us was going to bring it home. We're leading up to the race itself. Uh, one thing that strikes me is, you know, you're with a great team and you said partner event. A lot of the fans don't know what that is. So what is a yeah. partner event? Yeah, so that we've been doing it the last few years since uh, COVID and basically – just have all of our sponsors and um, all of our partners at Hendrick, you know, Chevrolet, everybody that supports the team, they come out. Uh, we do a little dinner on Saturday night before the season. And it's a great chance to just see everybody. And there's so many different, you know, brands on the car that a lot of times you don't get to see everybody in one space. But it's it's pretty cool. It's It's got a really high attendance and, you know, pretty much all of our sponsors come out. Yeah, make them feel important. Uh, that you, we all <laughs> yeah. are not. We're not racing without. We're them. not racing without them for sure. Now, now there's an old saying: if you're going to play, you got to pay, and, and we we got to have that money. So, the Daytona 500, they dropped the green flag on Monday. It was like 48 hours of rain. Uh, yeah, it just wouldn't stop. Yeah. And, uh, but they were able to get all the events in with a lot of audibles, and uh, even after the Daytona 500. I thought it was a funny nugget. You were in victory lane celebrating and the Xfinity race was going on. So when you were celebrating in victory lane still, and there was like a big race going on, was that weird? It was so weird. I've had that happen. <laughs> I had that happen during, uh, you know, late model shows. Like you'll go and you'll celebrate and then you'll go through tech and you're in the tech shed and you got the support race going on, you know, and whatever that is. And uh, so it, it was not foreign to me, but it was weird winning the Daytona 500, feeling like I was feeling like there was another race going on. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it ended up being cool. It was uh, it was a little loud in victory lane for sure. Well, what was wild is, you know, you were on the Big Bird, you were on Fox winning the Daytona 500. They switch over to FS1 and, you know, they're doing two shots they're showing the race but they're showing you in victory oh. lane oh were they and i didn't it, even know that oh yeah and, and, and it made me think man that victory lane's been going on for an hour or more so yeah <laughs> so the we're gonna get to the race a little bit but yep. when you're in victory lane for the date tone of 500 uh it seems to last a lot longer than a normal victory lane how much longer do yeah. you think victory lane at daytona lasts more than other ones Oh man. I mean, it, it really lasts for days. <laughs> Day, all, yeah. It really, you got to You realize how many people are, are a integral factor in what you do, you know, like going to victory lane, honestly, I, you know, when we won that race, I knew it was the Daytona 500, but I only have one mode and that's to try to win the race we're in. And I thought, man, how awesome. We won another race. This is great. And then as soon as I got out of the car, it was like, Oh, I realize what the Daytona 500 is. It's not just any other race. And so I think like going through that night, just in victory lane, all the different things that we did and the confetti and the, all the pictures and then going to New York and then going to the race shop and Chevrolet. So it, uh, it lasts for days for sure. We're going to get to some of that. Um, all right, let's, let's fast. Let's kind of get to the race at hand. So the race runs on and uh, I thought there was a lot, to be said, uh, I didn't know if it was deserved, but it was like the Fords are on the pole, the Toyotas suck, yeah, and 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 yourself and and, and uh, your teammate uh, Bowman, you guys are there for the win. He gives you a push, 
and you're going to spin out, but you end up getting into the right rear, uh, you know, of Brad Keselowski. Uh, yeah. That saves you. You do you do a restart, and uh, you're coming to the, you know, white flag. Tell me, tell me that whole scenario. Run me through that those things I just said. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, coming down to ten laps to go in the five hundred, everyone's pushing, and yeah, you know, for me, I was. Uh, I don't know if I've ever been in a 500 where it's three wide like that, you know, all the lanes pushing each other. And, um, and so I kept bouncing between the bottom and the the middle. And somehow I think with five or six to go or whatever, uh, Bowman and I got clear of the bottom. And so we moved to the middle and when we moved to the middle, the lanes in front of us were starting to shuffle around. And for whatever reason, when he was pushing me, we got out of shape. I got out of shape from him pushing me. And the 22 was also coming down the track just a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so we got all misaligned and that, and that big crash happened. So I think when that crash happened, obviously I was glad to get through it, but in, in a lot of ways I felt bad that it happened. And, um, so I think my crew chief knew that. And, uh, you know, he's like, look, man, like block it out. It doesn't matter right now. You, you know, you got, you can look back. Cause I kept asking him questions of what happened. Cause you really don't know in the moment. But, uh, so I think trying to block that out and trying to go after the next, restart was was the big key and then the restart there with four laps to go i just i had choice i didn't have choice of the front row so i was gonna take whatever uh chastain didn't and he chose the top which i thought was the right decision and uh luckily i lined up on the bottom with cindrick and he's a great pusher the ford the ford nose pushes really well uh Mm. lines up really well with our back bumper so you know when he pushed me the pushes were straight like intense he was pushing me all the way around the track so we got clear of um of chastain in the second lane and so i was able to control both lanes and then eventually they got a big run you know i think it was off turn four and i pulled up to block that and that's when chastain tried to go to the bottom and um and and that was really the end of the race so it was crazy i mean i don't i don't know in those moments you're not really thinking much but you're just trying to think about where the run's going to come from and how, how am I going to block it? And if I can't block it, what's where do I want to be? It was really interesting what you said. You said the Fords, their front bumpers align with the your car, Chevrolet, uh, you know, the, the rear bumper. Yeah. When I was racing, you know, we would just be out there in practice. We had a lot of practice in our day. And, and, and you know, all of a sudden you'd be out there in practice and you, you practice so much. You're like, hey, man, we were really, we were hauling butt with this guy. Yeah. So at what point did you find out that the Fords really aligned with your car? Was it in practice? Did somebody tell you? How did you know yeah. that? I think it's a little bit of history because like you said, we don't have practice. So for us, it's really what has worked in the past. You know, they yeah. had a slight body change to their car, but yeah, we went out and practiced on Friday, I guess it was. And we ran all the Chevys together, all the Toyotas ran together, all the Fords. And we realized right then, man, like, I'm not sure if we're all good together. Like, we need to spread out. We need to kind of mix ourselves, you know, amongst each other. And so um, that's kind of what we did. I mean, we obviously try to work together. We found each other in the end of the race, but we really just tried to mingle with the rest of the draft. And, um, you know, it seemed to work out pretty well. You know, uh, Ryan Blaney had mentioned that, you know, when it comes down to the end, you know, you can only work with your teammates so much. And I believe in, in one of the dual races, mm-hmm. you know, he pulled the last corner move and just, you know, I say this lighthearted. He he, he dumped Cindric, you know, his, his teammate, and won the race, yeah. rightfully so. Uh, but I think my question is, it seems to me that time's kind of repeating itself. We're hearing more like, we're like Formula One now. It's yeah. like Chevrolets, Fords, and and is is that true? I mean, is there more making that, you know, you guys are working as much as you can together or are you or, or are you still a little selfish? Yeah, I mean, there was a there was a very strong trend, I'd say, I'd say 2018 to 2022, probably where it was you only work with your guys. And that was great until it was extremely predictable to just work with whoever was, you know, on your Chevy. So, and I think the broadcast really got on that where they're like, Hey, well, this guy's, he's only going to push this guy cause he's a Chevy or he's a Toyota. And, um, 
it's just racing's not that easy. I mean, it's not. Yeah, right. You can't. You can have a great game plan, and then they drop the green flag, and you know it's two hundred miles an hour. You're not think. You can't always just go where you you know where it sounds good to go. So uh, I think it's just changed. People have realized, man, this isn't. We can't be this. Uh, you know, we can't be this predictable, and still try to win the race. So. I think it's kind of it goes in waves like this sport always kind of seems a cycle, but it just seems like we got in a trend of everyone doing the same thing. And that became very predictable. Years, years ago, Daryl Waltrip said, Herman, NASCAR is a monkey see, monkey do business. Those, those garage areas were parked right next to each other. It, it, yeah. Secrets don't don't last very long. So, OK, you win the Daytona 500 and uh, let's have a little fun now. You took us through some good parts of the race. Uh, you're done. It's your East Coast time. You're you're almost one in the morning, and yeah. you're done celebrating. Now I wake up the next morning. Somehow I wake up and I kind of get up what I think's early, and I'm in St. Louis, and you are already in New York, and you're on national TV. I mean, you're on the big big shows already in New York. <laughs> Take me. Take me and everybody else. Tell us about that timeline of leaving Daytona. How did you get to New York? Yeah. So we get down <laughs> with Victory Lane. We do the uh, we do the media center. I had a couple beers. And then uh, I, I went to my bus and called a few people, called my dad, uh, talked to him on the phone for a little bit, um, talked wow. to a couple, you know, Mr. H, talked to Jeff, and, and then uh, changed out my fire suit, which was soaked. And then... <laughs> And then took about 10 minutes just to breathe and said to myself, okay, what, what's next? So went from there, went to the garage, uh, saw my guys in the garage and they were, they were still tearing the car down. Um, and so I had a, a couple drinks with some of the guys and then about 1230, they told me, Hey, you know, the sooner you get on this plane, the more sleep you're going to have. So mm. it, uh, so we got on a plane, a uh, NASCAR plane and uh, flew to New York and then got in about three thirty and went wow. to bed at four and uh, slept till about six forty five and and did the tour. So my eyes the thing I didn't I didn't I underestimated the champagne or whatever. Ooh. This is a great problem to have, but it got in my eyes and I wear contacts. So Ooh. the next day my eyes were burning all day, but that's all right. Hey, you know what? A, a couple things. Um remind me because I'm trying hard. You're giving such good information. I want to talk about those contacts. But you mentioned something. You, you talked to some people. You talked to your dad, Mr. H, uh, of course, the great Jeff Gordon. But what what went on in the conversation with your dad after the Daytona 500? I mean, I think don't, it's, don't it's hard to remember. It's hard <laughs> to remember. But I think um, honestly, just hearing his genuine joy and excitement for for um, for me and just what it meant. I think we, I, I really feel like we talked about just what it meant and, and if we could ever have imagined to be in that position, you know, he and I just going to the racetrack together. And, uh, and so it was surreal. I think it was, um, it took till about Tuesday or Wednesday. And then he, he got choked up on the phone. I was driving Aww. home from the race shop and I called him, I think it was Wednesday. And he just, he told me how like surreal it was that, you know, 10 years ago, we were watching Dale Jr. win the 500 and I was just getting started in racing. And um, so it just, that was pretty cool. So in victory lane, you pointed your finger to those grandstands and you said it wasn't long ago that my dad and myself, what you just mentioned, you watched the Daytona 500, not a child, but a kid. Uh, yeah. Your path was extremely fast. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Tell me about that day. Uh, what maybe was, I don't even know if it was 10 years before your win at being the Daytona 500 champion. Uh, yeah. If, if we do a little math, when you, let, let's do it real quick. It, you yeah. and your dad sitting in the grandstands, you're watching the race. You see Dale Jr. win. How many more years did you just win this championship? Yeah. This 500? So, so actually the race I went to, the 500 I went to was when Trevor Bain won. So oh, it was 2011. Yeah. Let's so I would have been, I think I was like, shoot, I, I was born in 97. So Minus I was 14. 24. 
Yeah, 13 years. Yeah, thir- yeah. So, so you were in the grandstand. Years, yeah. You were in the grand. Okay, for all the kids listening, the, the kid you're looking at right now, he was in the grandstands watching, and 13 years later, he became that dream. Yeah. Wow. It's unreal. It's That's unreal. That's unreal. Wow. I mean, it. it I, was, I got goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, it is crazy because we, he and I, we went down there, and Trevor Bain uh, won the race as a 20 year old. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was that was probably the spark of my racing career. I mean, that's right around when I started racing or or at least getting in into eye racing. So, um, you know, which had been for years I had watched races, but the Daytona 500 I went to, yeah, when I was 13. Eye racing is next on my list, but I want to get to those contact lenses, and here's why. Uh, you know, Kenny Conversation, inter- we, we talked to all the drivers. Yeah. Uh, the great Jonathan Davenport. Port. We call him JD or Superman. Uh, yeah. JD's won a million dollars at Eldora. He won the World 100, won a million dollars. The million. It wasn't, I don't think it was the world, but it was the million. And when we had him on Kenny Conversation, he said he got into his career and he was blind as a bat. And, and at night, he saw halos. And I had people coming up to me after that Kenny Conversation. And yeah. Chris Madden and my friend, everybody... Now everybody's wearing glasses. Yeah. And, and when we watch the in-car cameras now of all the cup races, see a lot of heroes now wearing glasses. Yeah. So tell me about your contact lenses. They must be pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They've uh, man, I've been afraid to to change it. I've I've had a uh, contact since I started in the trucks in the truck series. So I uh you know, my vision started to change probably when I was yeah, right around 18 years old. And, um, what I noticed was I couldn't see the definition in the wall. So like when I come off the corner, I couldn't see, like I could see the wall, but I couldn't see exactly how close or how far I was. And I just that little bit of detail. So, um, I got contacts about the third, I think it was the third race of the year in the truck series. And, um, and we ended up having a really good year. So I, I didn't want to change it. I didn't want to change anything t- since then. But I think it helped. It, I mean, everyone's got different, you know, cadence. I, I wear glasses at night, but um, I've never experimented with wearing them in the in the car. The reason I bring this topic up is I, I know how much you can is, inspire kids that are coming up. And, you know, glasses have been around since the biblical days. And yeah. uh, eyes are never perfect. And, yes. you know, some kids might think you're perfect. You're a perfect specimen. And for you just sharing with us that, hey, champagne got in my eyes and I wear contacts, that, that will <laughs> yeah. make that kid that wants to be like you, William. Yeah. You, that's great information. You know, they, they feel well, like they can be you. Yeah. And there's a lot of detail that comes with it. Like I have to make sure I keep them super clean because like going into the race, like if you have a contact issue, like you're done. So it luckily, knock on wood, I've never had, you know, major issues, but um, definitely, you know, it's, it's all that preparation is really important. My this this is fun. My friend uh, Nick Hoffman, he builds my dirt cars. He cannot hear out of one ear, and he wears contact lenses. And, and, and but he whips her butt. So yeah, uh, yeah that's uh, that's just good <laughs> stuff. That's just good yeah. stuff. Well, let let's, and I say this with respect. Uh, let's talk about what made you so famous before you really started winning cup races. And uh, yeah, they said, William Byron, kid, all he did was run I races on computers. And now he drives for Henrik Motorsport. And I was right there with him. I yeah. was like, what? Yeah. Let's, let's de-bull it. Let, let, tell, tell all the kids how you did this. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it was very like coming into the, to NASCAR and being the only kid that had ever gone that route. And yeah, I mean, I started, so how I racing started for me was Dale jr. And Landon castle were very complimentary of I racing. They were talking about it all the time in interviews, they would get asked in the media center and I'm just a 11, 12 year old kid. That's watching. I would watch every practice on TV, watch every, every, you know, try to watch everything that I, we didn't have YouTube back then, but, 
I would watch all that. And then, um, so I figured out iRacing was a big platform. So I started racing on there and I started running races like three, four a day in the summertime. I'd run all day from, from when I got up to whenever I needed to do something. <laughs> so, get off your and, computer, kid. <laughs> yeah. And that was sometimes good and bad because, you know, you get pretty frustrated pretty quick. But it, uh, I would just race on there. I learned the, I learned the skill set that it took to, to drive. And, um, but I was always interested in, in racing and, uh, and so then got into the legend cars and, and late models and all those things in the real car. But I felt like every step of the way I was always discredited because I was the, the kid that started on computers, didn't, didn't earn it, like didn't race quarter midgets and go-karts. So it was always a tough kind of uphill battle to prove to people that I could, could drive. So we're going to keep talking about this, uh, but I want to tell you my experience. I go to movies every Tuesday night in my hometown. We got about 20 of us. That's and awesome. uh, it, it, the movie was called Gran Turismo. And, you know, I really didn't know what to expect, but it was a real movie. And, and it was about you, but not. Yeah. It, was, it was about an automaker that said, hey, we're going to find the best eye racers, basically, mm -hmm. in the world. And, and they, they felt like they did. And uh, in the end, the movie's incredible. I thought of you, the whole, whole darn movie. But in the end, they all go to the 24-hour Le Mans, and they yes. end up finishing third. And all three, all three drivers in this movie, Gran Turismo, they podium. Wow. And, and, and they made it. So, okay, now we know uh, that you ran like 300 races a year, is what you told me? Yeah. On iRacing? Yeah. Okay, so how do you get from the computer racing, how do you get to a real car? Yeah, I mean, luckily I grew up in Charlotte. So like Concord, they had the uh, Legend Car, U.S. Legend Car shop was there in Concord. So went up there, uh, met this guy, Jimmy Baker, and he told me to, he's like, hey, I'll take you a couple races. So we went to Concord Speedway. They had the little quarter mile track. Uh, behind the big one and yeah. uh, which i can't believe that place is is gone now that junky really little sad. track up and down yeah <laughs> oh yeah little little track half the track was under half the track was like you know it was like wilkes bro it went uphill and then went downhill and um super fun racetrack but i went watched a couple races out there and then the legend cars they had a driving school uh anyone could do it like it was just like i think it was three or four hundred bucks to go out and race drive Ooh. a legend car around okay. the fifth mile and so i did that twice and got got in, to know some of the owners some of the guys who own legend cars around concord so it just i mean really started with the the driving school i did that twice in the summer of probably eighth grade going into ninth grade and uh, i had a lot of speed racing you know driving the car so so you Crazy. you you told me uh I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I just think this was really awesome. What you told me on Trackside Live, our pre-race show at Atlanta, we were talking about this. And you said, and you said it very humbly, you were a second quicker than yeah. everybody else. And, yeah. and I'm bragging on you right now. That's what made you stand out. You came off, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but you, you get out of the computer, you go into the real car, and you're a second quicker than everybody. Yeah. And, and people took notice. Yeah. So I had, I couldn't get this car started. Um, so I was really <laughs> bad. I couldn't use the clutch. I didn't understand. I had never driven anything stick shift, but once I got on the racetrack, I, uh, there was another girl there and, and her, she had an agent. Um, she was up and coming. She had been racing dirt, dirt car or dirt go-karts and, um, and quarter midgets. And, uh, she, you know, her and I were basically the two people there that day and I was, yeah, I was making laps like a second faster and I was almost, I was only about a half a second off of the, tr the instructor guy who was, uh, who actually raced the legend cars. So, um, so I, I kind of got the, I got noticed by those people, by the guy who was, you know, instructing everybody. And then, um, she also had an agent that was actually David Reagan's agent at the time when he was mm. driving for Roush. So he was yeah. at the racetrack and um, and just got started just making connections with people at the racetrack. What would um, 
let's wrap this up because I got so much more to talk about. What would your message be? I don't want to put you on the spot, but a lot of kids know about you and, and the world is becoming more like this. You know, airplane pilots, they go in simulators. Mm -hmm. uh, what would your message be to the kids that know about you, uh, you know, being an iRacer and now you're a, you know, a NASCAR winner, a Daytona 500 champion. What would you say to them? I mean, I think it's just when I was younger, the desire was there to race in NASCAR and all that was there, but I just was having fun with it. I was trying to go and just, I just wanted to be at the racetrack and I just wanted to see what was going on in the pit area, you know, get a, get a pass to go walk around and, and try to get in somebody's race car and, just one thing led to another. And I feel like that kind of genuine passion that a lot of us in racing have that, that never goes away. Even when it gets, you know, I never thought I'd be doing like <laughs> all these interviews and things like I, for me, it was all about, I just want to drive the race car. And, <laughs> you know, right. that was, that was it. So I think keeping that the main thing is always important. And then all the other stuff comes with it. It's a lot of work, but it, you know, if you love driving race cars or working on them, I feel like it all kind of falls into place. You put yourself out there. I tell my three daughters that all the time. I say, go and do. Don't sit at home and say, well, he's got this. He's got that. He did this. He did that. And, and the great Dick Trickle taught me, you got to want to. And, and you wanted it. Uh, you went to the Daytona 500 as a fan. You know, some people just don't put themselves in your in the position and you loved it. So listen, uh, thanks for talking to me about that. I know you're yeah. tired of it. You're probably, are you tired of talking about that eye racing? No, I mean, yeah, for a while when I started, I didn't, I really shot away from talking about it because I felt like I was different and I, in, a, in not a good way. They didn't and like I didn't, you for it. Yeah. And I think for me, like, as I've gotten older, I realized that that's what, yeah, that's who I am. And that's where I came from. So it, you know, it's, I try to embrace it now. That's good. That, that really is emotional for me. Makes, makes me happy because as a young man, at, at, when I was 26 years old, there were some things I was bitter about. And later on in my life, I'm like, Hey, yeah, that did happen to me. And yeah. now I'm, I'm better, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, good job, uh, William. And I think that now that simulators and things like that i mean they're respected now so yeah you're you're the man you're you're the face of that because you did it yeah. and you're a daytona 500 champion um thank you yeah yeah you're you're awesome and because you go short track racing and you know that's my favorite <laughs> thing about you I, okay I, I gotta stop right now i'm at hickory i'm at uh, tri county and i'm testing the Cars tour, yeah. race car. Well, I get done testing, and I head east on 40, and I'm like, oh, my God, they're running the ASA race there. ASA's back. And one of my dear <laughs> friends, my partner, is Bob Sargent, and Bob's the promoter. So I pull in. I pull into Hickory, and I didn't even know you were there. And I watched you, and you were running like fourth or fifth, and you got caught on the outside, and they were, they were making your life miserable, and you would not give up. And at that time, I went, he's a badass. And then you <laughs> climbed the wall down the back straightaway. Oh, awesome. yeah. Racing for the – that was a heck of a race. That was last May that we raced for the lead and, like, side by side for, like, 20 laps. Was, okay, the lead, fun. yeah. Yeah, that was fun. Well, you yeah, did got, it, got put in the wall a little bit, but that's a, that's all right. That old boy <laughs> got tired of you. <laughs> yeah, hey, I'm going to get rid of him. I'm going to move up one foot. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I, I usually do this a lot earlier, but you were different. So I'm going to remind everybody, everybody knows this part of the show. I didn't do everything because you've done so much at only 26 years old, but listen to this. 26 years old, drives for Hendrick Motorsport, one of the greatest teams. Uh, Rick Hendrick likes you, loves your talent, hires you. 2015 NASCAR k and Pro Series champion. 2016 Rookie of the Year of the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series. This one is unbelievable to me. 2017 NASCAR Xfinity champion and 
rookie of the year at the same time. So that means in 2017, you're like, hey, I'm going to go run the Xfinity Series, and you do it all. You win the championship. Um, 2018, you went on to win uh, – you went on to race. You know, at, Well, you won the uh, NASCAR Cup Series Rookie of the Year in 2018. Now, one thing's impressive about this. It goes 15, 16, 17, 18. Every single year, you kept going up, up, up. 2019, okay, now 2018, you won the Rookie of the Year in a Cup. 2019, yeah. now you're on the pole for the Daytona 500. You're a Daytona 500 champion now. This We're not done. <laughs> 11 Cup wins, 4 X Xfinity wins, 8 truck wins. Now, I'm going to remind everybody, I don't want to hear it. Because he'd, he'd triple these numbers if he would have stayed in those lower series. But he's only 26. He moved up so quick. And then I saved the best for last. 2022, you went to the state of the Wisconsin. And you basically <laughs> won their Daytona 500. You won the 2022 uh, Slinger Nationals Championship. Uh, so now, I there, there's more. But when I tell you that, at only 26, what well, goes through your mind when I'm saying all that? Well, it makes me uncomfortable to hear my, <laughs> you talk How great about you it, are! <laughs> I, uh, I don't like hearing about about that stuff. But, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it just kind of the – it just makes you remember some of those awesome moments. I mean, the, I thought I'd never have a day like the day we won the Xfinity Championship. That was one of the biggest days of my career. And then, uh, you know, Slinger Nationals was a day that I was – I mean, that was an awesome – awesome feeling i never have felt that way at a short track just that many fans and that close to everybody and then uh yeah i mean it's just cool i i just you know i just think about the work it takes and trying to get to the the next one when you won slinger uh you you realize i'm sure you're a good study of the sport you knew that was the home of like matt kenseth yeah and, you know a lot of the big boys uh, so is that one reason it was such a big win for you yeah, I mean, I kind of educated myself on that race. I'd say I knew of it for a lot, you know, the three years before I ran it. But I watched Kyle Busch and Kenseth oh, yeah. run there and Eric Jones and Kenseth. And um, just a lot of people told me how big a race that was. And I didn't really realize it till it went up there. And, I mean, they've got the streets shut down and the crowd is packed. I mean, there's not many short tracks. You have stands all the way around all four corners and – um and then you go to qualify and you're the most nervous you've ever been. I mean, like you could miss the race or you could be on the pole and it's like Bristol times times two. So I don't know. It's a wild racetrack. Yeah. It's awesome. Right outside of Milwaukee. Everybody's drinking beer. They're having a damn good time. Yeah. That's beer drinking capital of the world. There's no doubt. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's call an audible. It means we're going to really do a, a 180. Um, you drive for arguably, uh, well, he is. I mean, Mr. H. Uh, there, there's not very many people. You, you, you got you got uh, Roger Penske. He, he's yes. the captain. And Rick Hendrick is Mr. H. So I guess you haven't really drove for anybody else because you're so young. What is, is Rick Hendrick really... Like they say, I mean, is he like a dad? Is he like family? Is he soft hearted? Yeah. What is he like? Yeah, the thing I the thing I always think about with Mr. H is when I started in the Cup Series. Now, you know, I, Rookie of the Year was great, but I had a few years where it was tough. It was hard to get results, and I feel like anytime you're in a Hendrick car, you're expected to get you know wins and compete for championships. And he just never doubted me. He just never. He never in his voice or anything he said to me ever gave me the impression that he wasn't sure of how, of what I was doing or, or didn't agree with it. And so he just gave me that confidence from an early age. And I feel like when we started winning races, it was the same way. He just, he, he's just always been encouraging me. And then the other thing about Mr. H is he makes sure that every person at Hendrick Motorsports feels uh, important. And I noticed that through, I mean, we were at the shop today and 
he wanted to shake hands with every single employee and take a photo with every single person. And that's just, not everyone does those kind of things. Yeah. See, he's a people person. I've heard, I've heard so many great stories and you're so young. I wanted to, I wanted to see if your story kept the lining. Mr. H has been very good to me. He's given me great advice uh, about life. So what is your weeks like? I mean, I know you're, you're, you're a young man. You do young things. Are you yeah. required uh, to go to Hendrick, uh, the shop? Do you, do you, are you required to go there every week? So no one's ever told me how much or how little I need to be there. I mean, I think all four of us are kind of do it a little bit different way. Um, I'd say I'm probably the most involved at the shop, you know, but I just, I enjoy that for my peace of mind. Like if I don't, if I don't go to the shop during the week, I feel like I'm missing out or I feel like I'm not doing everything that I could do. And that's just, I think growing up in Charlotte, being so close to the shop, it kind of makes sense. But I uh, I go to the comp meetings as much as I can. And then, you know, I go to the simulator with my team. So um, yeah, I feel like that's just what works for me. But I try not to go every week because it, you know, it can get a little bit, you know, our job as drivers is to be fast in the race car. So however you need to train or prepare is important. The fans would tear me up if I didn't talk to you about this. Uh, you drive the legendary 24. Um, and boy, have you done it justice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brag on you. Uh, Jeff Gordon is so proud of you. Uh, he said that in victory lane. He said, what a great driver you were. What do you, I mean, he's a lot older than you. And I mean, we all want to stay young, but yeah. what is your... When you and Jeff talk, is it small talk? Is it deep talk? What is it yeah. like to be with Jeff Gordon and driving his his number 24? Yeah, I mean, Jeff. It's yours now. It's your it, car now. Yeah, I think Jeff, like, we've gotten a lot closer over the years. I mean, when he was, uh, he might not say this, <laughs> but he was one of the most skeptical. I feel like when I came in, Mr. H was the one saying, hey, this guy, I really like this guy. And Jeff you know, hadn't seen any of what I'd done in the truck. Them series. eyebrows went down. <laughs> he, he was like, he was like, yeah, you know, I, you know, let's see, let's see how you do. It's really tough out there. And he was intimidating at first. He was very intimidating, but I feel like over the years, especially as soon as, as soon as I got through the Xfinity series and we kind of made a connection there in that championship race, he was down there watching the race. And I feel like it changed our relationship changed to, okay, how can we make you successful in, in our cup cars? And he, uh, he really just kind of took me under his wing and like he, we spent time, you know, he'll come over to my house, like in the off season, we'll, we'll, you know, have a coffee or whatever and like just talk racing. So we're pretty close. I mean, it's, it's gotten that way over the years, I think. And he's become a mentor. That makes me happy because uh, Jeff and I have a, a, a long distance, long time relationship. Uh, that makes me, happy because I, I remember him as tw 19 years old and here we are <laughs> older men now and, and seeing him it did surprise me that Jeff stayed in racing because yeah. I thought you know he would move on so for him to have that executive position at Hendrick uh that's yeah. really cool really nice of you uh to hear that okay we're going to do the the big 180 again uh <laughs> cha changing now Charlie Marlowe who, who operates everything here on Kenny Conversation. Charlie does it all. And you're tired of this one. But on the Kenny Wallace show, they're, they don't know about it. You have become legendary uh, for the Lego company. Children's <laughs> Legos. Put Legos together. But then there's the big boy Legos. We all heard it. Dale Jr. brought it back on, on, your, on the podcast. You built a 42-inch. Now, listen. That's big. That's 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 big. That's you know three feet thirty six. You build a yeah. forty two inch Titanic ship with Legos. <laughs> Take me through this Lego thing. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean it's sitting over there on my on my in my living room. But it uh, yeah, I mean it um, that was a project. I think uh, it started just a few years ago. I just you know it's kind of like what what do you get your you know what do you get for Christmas when you become an adult like. What is it? You know, you get clothes, you get socks. 
And uh, I just I started asking for Lego sets. And so <laughs> I, it great. basically started with uh, I built the first thing I built was the Lego piano and it actually plays music, which is pretty awesome. And uh, and I just was hooked as soon as I built that the amount of focus it took and how it got me off of my phone and it got me thinking, you know, in a different headspace than being on the computer. And uh, it just I just loved it. I think it's very therapeutic and um, it's kind of become more of an intense hobby over the years. But it's uh, just something I enjoy. Yeah, that's really awesome. And you and you were on, I guess, was it a Fox a TV show that made this so popular? Yeah, Lego Masters. Lego yeah. Masters. That yeah, was that, that was fun. Yeah. Where did you go to do that? I uh, that was in Atlanta. So that oh. was a couple. Yeah, that was a couple years ago. Uh, we went down to Atlanta, Jeff and I both. So that was pretty fun. Hey, listen. I, it just reminded me uh, when I first met Jeff Gordon. He, he, I thought he was a little weird because he had a, a pet snake and like, <laughs> it, yeah, and Jeff had a snake and one of the greatest race cry drivers of all time. So uh, it's pretty incredible, you know, uh, race car drivers nowadays, uh, you know, you don't got to be dirty. You don't got to prove that you're underneath the car. Uh, that's pretty cool. And I do agree with that being, you know, I love models. You know, I would go get the Jags. I'd, I'd go get the Jags model, you know, and, yeah. and Don, Don Gregory was the driver and I loved models. So uh, I, cool. can, I can relate with you. All right, uh, man, we got about five minutes left. Here we are right at an hour. And uh, I apologize. I got to rough you up uh, in, no in, a, in a mature way. Uh, so there's this dynamic out there in, in America right now about NASCAR. They, they say, it, it's not me, but I've, I've talked about it a little bit. They say it is so hard to find sponsorship now. Mm -hmm. that the car doesn't have enough money. So all the new drivers like William Byron, Ryan Blaney, uh, so on and so forth, the new drivers like yourself, mm -hmm. like you guys hardly make any any uh, base pay. So in other words, uh, you know, let's say Clint Boyer would make $6 million base. Mm -hmm. And the word on the street is that you make $250,000 base. That's, 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 that sounds crazy to me, but I don't, you know, I watched Dale Jr. last night and he, he asked Daniel Suarez a question. It was a minute long question. And Dale Jr. has taught me, you know, they teach at NBC to ask the question quick. Well, uh -huh. it's hard to ask this question quick, but I'm doing my best. Uh, is that false? I mean, I know you could make a lot more money on percentage, yeah. but are drivers like you helping the team out by making minimal pay? No, I think that's mostly false. I think Good. It, it definitely is Good. false for the 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 great drivers or the guys who are winning races. Like but you. I do yeah, I do think that there is a and I heard Kyle talk about this, there there's an average, you know, and I think that it if we get drivers who come in that that do race for, you know, whatever that number is and just kind of bring everything down that it's important that we hold that value. And I think that the drivers, you know, we've got a council and, and we've got a lot of things going on behind the scenes to make sure that that doesn't happen. But, um, but yeah, I was definitely concerned about that coming in, but the best thing you can do is win races and compete up front and, uh, and you get, you know, and you're going to be in line to, to make what those guys make, but it's a performance sport. Um, that'll never change. But yeah, definitely the the bottom line, I guess, and the and the overall average of the series has probably shifted over the last few years. But I think it's important that when new drivers come in, that they uh, that they demand their value, and I think that that really kind of establishes it. I really appreciate you asking that because you know, uh, yeah, obviously I'm like you. I'm in I'm in the there's no union for any of us, but I'm in the racers union, so you yeah. Know, I, I say that, you know, a baseball player that can throw a ball really good and yeah. he's very talented. He gets $20 million a year. And, and here you are cheating death and it has happened. And, yeah. you know, it, it's a shame. Uh, but, you know, I, I feel like race car drivers are extremely underpaid and, and I won't have it 
that, you know, they're doing what they want to do. I'm just saying make as much money as you can. Yeah. Because number one, you're talented and you deserve it and you're cheating death. It's still a very dangerous sport. Well, I think a lot of, a lot of guys told me like, like Max always told me this with, um, you know, he was really good, really close with Ayrton Senna and you're the money that you make as a driver is, is what people view you as like, it's, it's your mm. value. And so I think that's how I look at it is, is it's how people value my ability, my, um, how I can get the job done inside the car. So it's important for sure. Damn. That's really good. I like that. You just taught me something. <laughs> yeah. That's your, your value. Well, listen, it's been incredible. Um, uh, You've been so nice to me all these years. I want to. I want to thank you. And and let's end it like yeah. this. You're you're a young man. I don't know if you have much, but we we ask this question at the very end of all of them, uh, and, and it's a lot easier now. We don't go into tech inspection and fines, but as a Daytona 500 champion now, and you've won a lot of Cup races, what are your thoughts of NASCAR today? Man. It's a loaded question. Are um, you too young? <laughs> I'm, probably, I'm probably pretty young to give my give my perspective, but from watching, I guess what I would say about it is I feel like from watching when I was younger to first getting into sport, when I was coming up through the ranks, I was very nervous about where the sport was going and what yeah. kind of future like like you just said with the pay and with everything you that goes into it, is there a future? Is it is it something that is going to be around? And I feel like NASCAR has taken a major positive turn the last two and a half years that I've seen, um, really since COVID. The racing on the track is as competitive as it's ever been. And the closeness of how we all operate, there's a lot of tension in the garage. Everyone, nobody likes each other, you know, it, and I don't think that's always captured, but there is a lot of aggressive driving going on out there. And I feel like there's a lot because of how close it is. And I just feel like our sport is in a really good spot. You know, it's, it's the, the competition is breeding all the excitement. The only thing I wish for our sport is that it gets back to that national level of coverage with some of the sports broadcasting like ESPN and some of these places that, that it deserves because the competition is really is fierce right now. Marcus Smith, who owns, a lot of the NASCAR tracks, you know, whether it's Vegas, you're going to right now. He owns Vegas. He owns Bristol. We brought Trackside Live back because, you know, they dumped, you know, the Speed TV channel to bring yeah. FS1 back. And with that, NASCAR race day built by the Home Depot, which made the sport incredibly popular. Uh, they destroyed it all. And Marcus said, we got to bring this back, Kenny. Would, yeah. would you please do some shows? So myself and John Roberts uh, are doing it for about eight races at the SMI tracks, you know, Charlotte, Bristol, so on and so forth. Yeah. When you were in Atlanta just last week and you came on the Trackside Live show and we're entertaining the fans now, we're yeah. back to what we messed up. When you yep. saw that crowd, what did you think? It makes me excited because I feel like I'm seeing that a lot more. Like I'm seeing tracks. I'm seeing the stands full when we do the national anthem and you look to your right and you see, you know, full grandstands. Like when I came in the sport in 2018 was my rookie year. Like it was not that way. Like it was, it was pretty dire, pretty ugly. Pretty, it was ugly. And <laughs> a lot of times the conversation with my crew chief was, man, like, like it was encouraging if we saw a good crowd. Now it's it's almost expected. And so I think our sport, just the excitement and the fan, like you said, on track side, like, I mean, it was packed all the way out to the guardrails. So I just feel like there's a lot more of that going on. I, and I want to contribute. I think the new wave of drivers is motivated to, to contribute to that excitement. Yeah. And, and thank you for saying that right at the end, because Trackside Live is for the fans to get their cars, get their vehicles parked early, yeah. have something to do. And William, you know, it was packed because the drivers like you, you know, they were there to see the Daytona 500 champion. That show does not work without somebody like you and Christopher yeah. Bell and Brad Keselowski, Ty Gibbs. They came to see you. So, so thank you for doing yeah. your part. 
you know, we got to work hard, man. It, it, anything worth doing, it requires work. And I want to thank you for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think this sport, you know, it's not guaranteed, but I think it's, I think they're doing, there's a lot of good things going on and we just have to keep sharing that. Well, you're awesome, buddy. Uh, listen, that's it. All right, everybody. Uh, remember, they always say, put that show in podcast form. So William was an hour long. Leave your your house. Go to go to work. Listen to him on the way to work. Turn around. Listen to William on the way back. We are on iTunes. We're Spotify, and this is the big Kenny conversation on YouTube. Please subscribe, and uh, William, uh, do good out in Vegas. Thank you. Thanks, Kenny. And we're looking forward to it. First, first, you know, first uh, real test for us. That's everyone in the garage knows that, so it'll be fun. All right, everybody. We'll see you on the next Kenny Conversation.